Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. Well, we often get caught up in the technology of the moment, practical things that will immediately improve our lives. Things like digital technology, miniaturization, AI and all its promise, rockets to the moon and Mars. But we forget about all of the physics and its discoveries that goes into any and all of this. These discoveries were really big inventions that changed the world. And when they happened, often no one knew what their purpose might be, if any, and how the world might change. Often they were just the result of curiosity, of serendipity, and most of all, the vision to see things that never were and ask why not. These are the discoveries that my guest, Dr. Susie Sheehy, writes about in her new book, The Matter of Everything. Dr. Sheehy is a physicist and academic who divides her time between research groups at the University of Oxford and the University of Melbourne. She's currently focused on developing new particle accelerators for applications in medicine, and it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Susie Sheehy here to talk about the matter of everything, how curiosity, physics, and improbable experiments change the world. Susie, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Jeff. It's lovely to be here. Well, it is great to have you here. It does seem like physics and discoveries in the world of physics become the, the fundamental basis of, of everything that we kind of take for granted nowadays, and that so many of those discoveries, as you write about, were almost accidental in some cases. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I, I feel that's right. And we've also become a little bit disconnected from the idea of where the discoveries came from that underpin our modern technologies. Perhaps because the rate of pace has been just so dramatic in the last century, in particular, even in the last 10 years, you know, that the idea of making products out of what we now know uh, sort of excites people and drives forward, you know, new things that we can buy or new shiny things. While we've become a little bit disconnected from um, exactly how it is that we come up with new ideas and new understanding of the fundamental nature of reality, which allows us to drive these things forward. It allows things like miniaturization when we find new mechanisms that can, that can do that within our technologies. Um, and what I've tried to capture, as you said in this book that I've written, is those stories um, from physics in particular over the last 120 years and the ways in which we actually go out into the world and build experiments in particular um, that come up with these things and how it is as people that we're able to go into a lab and find something entirely new and perhaps, as you say, unexpected. Is one of the problems today that, that the things that we still want to know, the things that we still have to find out within the realm of physics are so complex and, and so expensive and so large to figure out that that changes the equation somehow? It does feel like that now within my sort of general field, which is the field of particle physics. Um, I, you know, 120 years ago, we had never even sort of seen an atom, as it were. We didn't even know if they were real, let alone know that there are constituents within them and that there are a whole bunch of other particles that don't even make up atoms. And all of those discoveries um, have revolutionized the way we think about the world, but have also allowed us to revolutionize technology. But now you're quite right that the energy scales that we're talking about, so that is the amount of energy you would have to put into something like a particle collider in order to produce new physics, as we refer to it, um, is just harder because the, that low-hanging fruit has has been found. But I think that doesn't preclude us from finding something big and new and exciting, perhaps even with smaller experiments, or perhaps from different fields of physics. Um, and I think it's important that we we look into all of these different avenues, into the gaps in our knowledge, right? Because that's actually where the exciting stuff lies, is look at what we know, but then also look at, in particular, at what we don't know, at what we can't explain. And then that's almost certainly where new and exciting discoveries are going to be made. But yes, it, it has shifted now the way that we do, especially these big um, scientific experiments. We have these huge collaborations like the ones with CERN at the Large Hadron Collider, um, where there's thousands of people from, you know, tens of different countries all working together towards one goal. And so, yeah, it is harder to make those really fundamental discoveries in my field. But what's come out of that is actually quite 
interesting, that ability to collaborate and the systems we've created to collaborate are possibly even more useful <laughs> than the results of the physics. Does it make accidents less likely? Does it make a serendipitous finding that, and so many of which you write about in, in the book, does it make those harder today? Mm, that's a really good question. It's it would be really hard to know without sort of you know digging in and doing a sort of proper historical <laughs> study. I think, but but certainly the intuition that a lot of people get, or the sort of impression that a lot of people get, is that it's harder to make a serendipitous discovery nowadays. I mean, like you, or I get the impression from you, like I feel a little bit sad about that. Right. Um, that perhaps it's a little harder to to make serendipitous discoveries, certainly on those big experiments, and yet. In many ways, that's actually what we need to do is be able to make discoveries that are beyond our imagination and beyond even the theories that we have. And that's really where the role of the experimental scientist, a lot of people don't realize that in physics even, really there's sort of two breeds of physicists. There's the theoretical physicists that we hear about a lot and they tend to write most of the books and appear in the media. And then there's the experimental physicists who are usually busy down in the lab. Um, and there's many more of the experimental type of physicists, right? But their role isn't just to go out and confirm or validate or find evidence for the theories that the, the theoretical physicists come up with. Their job goes a little bit beyond that. And of course, they have all these technical skills and amazing, you know, varied, almost craft-based skills sometimes in order to build and design experiments. But they're the ones who have to be sort of very open-minded to seeing something in their experiment and going, hmm, that's strange. I'm going to investigate that a bit further because that's exactly, as you're pointing to, that's exactly how we head towards these serendipitous discoveries. And that is also harder sometimes, I think, in these big collaborations where there's pressure to pursue, um, you know, specific measurements. But it is also something which is still possible within the structure of how we work nowadays, because we tend to work in these sort of small groups of about 10 or 20 scientists in, say, a university group. And then those groups choose what they work on and they join together. And eventually these big collaborations emerge out of that. Um, and so there's lots of small experiments that happen and lots of small projects alongside the big international collaborations. Um, and, and, yeah, it's very hard to predict which of those are going to produce the exciting new results that sort of revolutionize science again into into the, the next era. The interesting area you, you mentioned before, filling in the gaps in our knowledge. And in filling in those gaps, in many cases, those gaps are based upon theories and understandings that we have. The, the interesting part is when all of a sudden we start to fill in those gaps, I suppose, and it throws everything else off because it's not what we thought it might be. Right. And that's the most exciting thing. <laughs> um, so, you know, for example, uh, very early in, you know, in the stories that I tell, um, this scientist, Willem Röntgen, sees this glowing screen across his lab and uh, he doesn't understand why it is, so he investigates. And what he realizes is that there's invisible rays coming from this device ice called a cathode ray tube in his lab. And by investigating the properties of those rays, he uh, comes to learn that they can go through uh, the skin, through sort of lightweight or lo low density tissues, for example, but they're stopped by heavier objects like bone or metal. So what he actually finds is what we now call x-rays and what have now, you know, as you say, it's one of these technologies that we just take for granted. If I hurt myself, if I have, you know, if I've broken a bone, you just take for granted, you can go in and get an x-ray and that people can see inside of you um, without having to cut you open, right? And that was wasn't, that wasn't something we could take for granted until uh, we understood the properties of X-rays and could generate them and use them for that for that technique. Um, so that's you know just one little example. But there's other ways in which looking for these gaps in our knowledge uh, can sort of lead us um, in in new directions. So, uh, for example, asking questions even about. about um, sort of the fundamental nature of matter and the fundamental forces, which really came to a peak in sort of the 1960s, led to people building these big machines, these big labs, these big particle accelerators, which is the technology that I work on, and just pushing at the boundaries of um, that technology in order to investigate what they wanted to to find out led to 
new inventions, which could then be used in other areas of society. So one example that came from that is we now use big uh, circular accelerators to produce beams of particles for a very precise form of cancer treatment known as proton therapy or, or particle therapy. Um, and this is now the cutting edge form of cancer treatment. And the push now is, of course, to make those accelerators themselves even smaller and cheaper and, and better, um, which is one of the areas that I work. So this is the thing, like by identifying knowledge gaps and going after them, we're all is pushing at the frontier of what is technologically possible, which gives us the possibility both to find out new things about nature, but also to invent new things in the world. And that that's a pretty exciting sort of dual story to live, I think, as an experimental scientist. Does the complexity of, of where we are today, the complexity of those things that haven't yet been verified or discovered, things like quantum mechanics, and the complexity of that and, and the fact that it is harder to explain to people impact the way we think about all of this? Mm, that's Yeah, that's interesting, just the pure complexity of it. I mean, there have been some studies done even in our education systems about the way that we teach subjects like physics, right? Because we tend to teach them along this historical line where we teach people about Newtonian mechanics and we give kids this impression that everything is um, predictable, you know, like a billiard ball table. Uh, you can you know, apply a force and then predict everything for all of time. And there's been studies done where people, kids have been introduced to more complex ideas like Einstein's relativity, like ideas of quantum mechanics, which is very well verified now, by the way. Um, and they've introduced that to kids at like the age of, you know, nine or 10. And the kids are just totally fine with it, right? And then they, so they develop this, what we call a physical intuition um, much earlier in their lives. And it's it's a pretty... I thought that was a pretty exciting intervention in the school system is like, well, why are we teaching people stuff that we now know is is not actually how the world works on some level? And so sometimes these ideas are only complex and counterintuitive to us because we've held a biased idea that's different from that, um, often through our education system. Now, this is not to say we need to overthrow the education system, <laughs> right? But it, it does raise a question of are we are we only confused by things because they're unfamiliar to us because we don't um, learn about them uh, at an at an early age. Like maybe maybe kids nowadays would be totally fine with the idea that waves and particle, you know, light can be a wave and a particle and that's totally fine, right? I mean, um, I, I, but, I, yeah, I guess yeah. it's a matter of deconstructing stuff. I mean, there are things that kids, staying with the education part of it for the moment, things that kids take for granted, even rockets and going into space without mm. necessarily deconstructing the physics that really make it possible. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, so I guess then, but kids are also like, you know, they're sort of inherently curious. So they ask, you know, all sorts of questions about how the world works. Um, and I guess, yeah, where that complexity does come in is that the, the world might work differently on different sort of scales, either time scales or length scales or um, you know, energy scales, if we're going to talk about about physics. But um, but yeah, I, I think now one of the things that is confusing for people is that our technologies appear so simple, right? Because we've got all these wonderful people who work in, you know, user experience design who make them absolutely beautiful. Like think about, you know, even the computer I'm sitting in front of now is just the most beautiful object, so easy to use, so intuitive. And yet what's inside there, if I pull it apart, is so not easy to understand and so not um, intuitive. And I guess that is a big shift that's happened. Like if you think back to the 1940s, 1950s, our technologies were much more obvious. You know, what was inside something was much more was much more obvious. And so there is, I think, a concern at this point in time that like, if you're not highly educated in that level of technology and engineering and physics, we've got this big disconnect between um, what our what is actually at the cutting edge of technology and what your average everyday person understands about that technology. And to me, the biggest concern there is then the average everyday person who buys that technology thinks that all the brilliant things inside their computer come from, you know, one or two companies in, say, Silicon Valley um, and forget that fundamentally behind all of these things, you've got this entire ecosystem 
of people around the world doing research, doing development, doing engineering, um, that the materials that their, their, their devices are made from um, impact the world and that we need to have this much wider view of the contributions to so-called progress in our society and, you know, almost stop idolizing these like couple of tech companies and yes they're great they do great things sometimes they do great research as well but fundamentally they're there to sell you a product right so who are the people in the background who actually don't have a stake in like usually don't have a financial stake at all in the outcome of their investigations well that's the researchers who are going into their lab every day doing new things and at the moment i think in our society we idolize the tech companies and we forget that those companies literally wouldn't exist without these people who are sort of more selflessly going into their lab every day and discovering discovering new things sorry off on a bit of rant bit no, of a rant there but <laughs> it's okay <laughs> because what it does the the overlay to it which you talk about in in the matter of everything is that it impedes curiosity. If, if everything mm. comes to you pre-made, pre-digested, ready to use, very simple, very intuitive, as you say, it, it, it cuts into our curiosity about it. Right, like how can I ask a question uh, or investigate something or like, you know, pull something apart that literally I'm not allowed to pull apart or it voids the warranty, right? Which is just the most boring thing. So yes, I think you're right that it impedes curiosity. And yet... The way that we uh, make progress in our knowledge about the world is through this fundamental process of just being curious and asking good questions about things, about the nature of things and how they work and giving ourselves the time and space and opportunity to ask those questions about the world. And yeah, it does worry me that that's a much harder thing to do now. Um, and especially in our day-to-day -day lives, most people's work now, uh, unless you're lucky enough to sort of work in a creative industry or perhaps in a research role, most people's work does not give them the space to actually really be curious, to ask those big questions about the world, you know, because there's stakeholders and deadlines and, you know, all of these uh, KPIs that need to be met every day. So if they find a gap in knowledge, you know, if I'm working in some big international company and I find a gap where I'm like, hey guys, how does this thing actually work? Or like, um, you know, maybe if we did it this other way, we could save uh, all these resources on our planet. And, you know, people are not given the time and space to pursue those ideas because that's not their job or like that's not going to meet their target for the month or, uh, you know, nobody, it's almost like nobody cares. And yet those questions, that question asking is something that brings us alive as people. And I, to me, this is, there's this huge gap between what we spend our, um, you know, our downtime, our leisure time doing, and often people who work in those sorts of jobs where they're like, <laughs> you know, just produce the product at the end of the day. They're the ones who love listening, you know, watching, you know, astronomy uh, programs on television and, you know, they're voracious learners and they're really switched on. And yet the way in which our society operates, we have these day-to-day -day roles where we don't get to use that part of our humanness uh, to use our curiosity. So, um, you know, even if you could just do one thing uh, at work in the next week where you're like, hey, I got curious about this thing and I pursued it. Like, I feel like that's something we, we need to encourage people to do because otherwise we don't really make progress. I guess the other place we make progress, and, and I ask you this, do you feel that in the scientific community that there is enough pure curiosity today as opposed to that which is driven by a, an economic determination? Right, and this this is the thing. Our, um, yeah, our, our world of research and, and science is not immune to this right? Um, so I guess, you know, very early, in, even when, you know, the word scientist was was coined, um, and early in the process of the physical sciences, uh, you know, very few people had the opportunity to, to do research. And often it was, you know, funded by themselves. They, you know, the sort of gentleman laboratory uh, at home was like the early, the very early phase. And then we had these institutionalized version, you know, the academic institutions where researchers would work. Um, and then 
you know, governments would fund that research, but partly because they could see the economic um, impacts of it. And likewise, you know, in the last 100 and 120 years, through this amazing ad adventure that I of the stories that I tell around um, discoveries about things like uh, electrons and quarks and uh, the fundamental nature of matter, the outcome of all of that is the vast majority of our modern technology from electronics to medical technologies to industrial processes to many other fields of science using the techniques of the physical sciences to, to make progress and things like vaccine development, which is obviously an important one recently. And and so we make, you know, we make all of this progress and then we make the case to government, oh, you should definitely be funding research because it leads to all these practical outcomes. And in many ways, science is supposed to lead to the improvement of our lives, right? But if you just fund it because it happens to have some practical outcomes and produce some products, I feel you're you're missing a trick about why it is that we do research in the first place. And that is, that really does come down to this, this curiosity that we have to know more about the world. And I think it is important to hang on to the idea that it is worth seeking knowledge, even if it has no practical outcome. And the stories that I tell are mostly about people going out there and seeking knowledge about our universe, specifically with no practical outcome in mind. And then the story that emerges from that is most of our modern technology, right? And I, I do feel that this curiosity-driven research has the potential to create ideas and knowledge that compounds in usefulness over time. That's one of the key key things that I found in these stories is that if you do something without a direct application in mind in the first place, it's far more likely to actually have the ability to connect with other ideas and create really new revolutionary technologies. Um, so things like connecting up x-rays with uh, computing power gave, gives us you know, CT scanners, things like that. The ability to make magnets out of superconducting materials um, led to MRI scanners in hospitals and levitating trains and potentially fusion reactors as well. So, yeah, this this compounding over time is a very important part. And I think it's important that funding bodies don't lose sight of being able to fund research that is done out of pure curiosity. I mean, I now work in Australia and on every single grant application, no matter if you're trying to, you know, find dark matter, you have to put in this box of the national interest test to sort of say, how is this going to directly benefit uh, the citizens of this country? And uh, every time I get to this, it calls to mind this quote from um, Robert Wilson, who was defending the construction of Fermilab, which is the biggest accelerator lab um, in the US. And, you know, they did, they made amazing discoveries there. But when he was justifying it to, um, to the senators in about 1969, he was challenged on whether or not it would um, uh, be of use to the, in the uh, national security, in the defense of the country. And his response, I mean, the whole quote, the whole quote is in the book, but his response was just beautiful. And he harks back to this idea of science being a, a creative and, and sort of curiosity driven process um, that has value anyway. And and he closes with this, this statement that says um, it has nothing to do with defending our country except to make it worth defending, which I think is absolutely beautiful. And I think how the way that we think about funding science and its utility we need to keep that in mind, that the seeking of knowledge and the understanding of the universe in which we live is fundamentally of value, just in the same way that philosophy is fundamentally of value or art is fundamentally of value. It's a part of our culture. The thing about science that's perhaps different is that some of these things which at the moment they're discovered, and you tell a lot of these stories in the book, may not have any utility, but years later, sometimes decades later, in pursuit of trying to solve a problem, they find utility. Exactly. Yeah. So there's um, there was one chapter that I wrote in particular, which is a great example of this, where most of the other stories I sort of knew going in that there were direct applications, right? So, for example, even um, you know, in the 1940s, uh, sorry, 1930s, they discovered this particle called the muon, which is like a heavy version of the electron, but it doesn't appear in our everyday matter, and they found it. Um, in cosmic ray experiments. 
And you sort of think, oh, come on, there's not going to be any use for that, right? We're not going to have muontronics in the same way that we have electronics, right? Um, which is fair because it's an unstable particle. <laughs> it's going to decay. But instead, what they used it for, because it travels through um, uh, many meters of rock without being stopped, unlike um, an X-ray or an electron. Uh, and so they use it like a giant X-ray scanner. And so they've been able to scan pyramids and volcanoes and see the lava activity, the, the magma activity in, in volcanoes and find new hidden rooms in um, in in. Uh, some of the ancient pyramids uh, by measuring um, these muons that come uh, from cosmic rays that rain down on us all the time. So that, you know, that was a completely unexpected application of that one. But the, the one that I thought that there would be no application of was this really ghostly, very uh, strange particle called a neutrino. Um, and they were predicted you know, in the 1930s. And it was the person who predicted it. Um, his name was Pauli. He he was like, oh my goodness, what have I done? I've done a terrible thing. I've I've predicted a particle that can't be discovered, because they so rarely interact with our everyday matter that they're incredibly difficult to actually detect. And it took about twenty years before some experimenters went after the discovery of this type of particle, um, which uh, you know again it, it it plays a role in in radioactivity, but. You know, there's no particular use for this particle, it would seem. And, and, you know, they spent years and years and years building these deep underground experiments with these huge tanks full of, like, um, liquids, like dry cleaning fluid, looking for tiny little light flashes that would happen if this neutrino particle travelled through this big underground um, experiment. And uh, now neutrinos are of great interest to physicists because they're one of these knowledge gaps. They're trying to understand um, why they're so lightweight and how they interact and all of their properties is actually one of the things we still don't fully understand. But in writing the book, I actually found that people have also thought about the idea of neutrinos, uh, of practical applications of neutrinos. And one of them um, blew my mind, which is this idea that because neutrinos can travel so far, they can travel through light years of lead without stopping right? Which makes them an ideal sort of cosmic messenger. So if there are other civilizations out there, it's quite likely that if they understand neutrinos, they would choose neutrinos to communicate across the universe because they don't get stopped by everything else and they don't get bent so much because they only have a very light mass. Um, and so in the US, uh, again, they've, uh, and I think it, this experiment was done at Fermilab actually, they encoded a beam of neutrinos that they were creating with a particle accelerator. You sort of smash a beam into a target and that can generate a, a neutrino beam. And they encoded it with a, a secret message and they sent it through hundreds of kilometers of rock to a detector, you know, miles and miles away. And then they detected the stream of neutrinos because now we're, we're a bit better at detecting them and then decoded the message and it, and it worked. Right. So they demonstrated this idea that potentially one day we could use neutrinos as a kind of cosmic messaging system. And there's no other mechanism out there that we know of that would do that quite as effectively. So that speaks exactly to what you were saying, that sometimes it takes us decades and decades to realize where this knowledge may be of use to us. But if we didn't have the knowledge, then there'd be no way we could invent that new technology or that new technique. So yeah, finding the knowledge is, is fundamentally of value in itself. And the other part is that we don't know what the problems are that we're going to face 20, 30, 50 years or more from now. So so we don't know what those applications might be. Exactly. And we're so bad at predicting it, right? Like if you ask, um, it, it was around 1900, I, I found this after I wrote the book, um, there was this world fair in Paris um, where they tried to get people to predict and they got artists to try and predict sort of what the world would be like in the year 2000 um, from 1900, right? And uh, they they produced this series of postcards of of art, and it was it was beautiful because some of the ideas were were kind of in there, but the reality was very different. So they were obsessed with uh, flying machines because the, the Wright brothers hadn't taken their inaugural flight yet. Um, so they were like, you know, painting all these weird and wonderful flying machines. But for example, um, architecture and the clothing that the people were wearing in the images that they painted hadn't changed at all. And they thought, okay, well, perhaps we'll be able to um, 
teach people uh, through some electronic or electrical means. So they have this picture of these students in a classroom with like sort of these brain headphones on with like these wires connecting them and that that's how um, learning was going to happen, which is interesting, right? Because they had no prediction that uh, they could transmit things like um, electricity in any other way or transmit information um, wirelessly, uh, which it, you know, relies on different physics from what they were understanding at that point in time. Um, they also had a massive obsession with living under the sea, which is interesting because that one didn't happen. Um, and yet, you know, we're reaching a point where, uh, you know, we have a space station in space and we have people trying to think about how we might be able to go and live on, on other planets um, because living under the sea isn't entirely practical. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I just thought it was really interesting that the imaginations of people in 1900 as to what the world would be like in the year 2000 massively underpredicted the change that would happen and the technological capabilities that would emerge. And a lot of those technological capabilities are down to the fundamental discoveries from curiosity-driven physics research. Dr. Susie Sheehy, her book is The Matter of Everything. How curiosity, physics, and improbable experiments change the world. Susie, I thank you so much for spending time with us today. Thank you. It's been a great chat. Thank you.